first-class scientific research, effective, convenient access to tools, facilities, and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union-funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top-tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Assemble Plus conference, Marine Biological Research at the Frontier. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Vincent Laudet. Professor Laudet completed his PhD in Life and Health Sciences in 1992 at the University of Richmond in France, with research performed at the Institut Pasteur of the same city. He became professor at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon in 1997, and from 2007 to 2015, he was professor, exceptional class, and director of the Institut de Genomique uh, Fonctionnelle de Lyon. From 2015 to 19, he became professor, exceptional class at Sorbonne University, and director of the Observatoire uh, Sinologique de Banyul sur Mer, uh, of course, one of the partners of, uh, of, of, of Assemble Plus. Since 2019, he is professor at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. Much of Professor Lode's research has been on nuclear hormone receptors. He performed the first evolutionary analysis of nuclear hormone receptor family, focusing on the study of retinoids and thyroid hormone receptors in the evolutionary process through evo-devo studies using amphioxus as a model organism. He studied the evolution of ligand binding abilities of various nuclear receptors and the origin of nuclear receptor ligand. And he studied the effects of environmental pollutants acting via nuclear receptors. More recently he developed coral reef fish as a marine model organism for ECOEVO DIVO studies. His group focuses on the evolution of life history strategies, in particular the recruitment of fish larvae to the reef and the role uh, that hormones play in this process. With the H index 74 and more than 20,000 citations, Professor Lode has been a leader in this field and has contributed to more than 220 scientific papers and 40 reviews, many in top journals, including Nature, Cell, PNAS, et cetera as well as two books on molecular endocrinology, molecular evolution, genomics, and developmental biology. He has received multiple awards and was a finalist at the Descartes Prize, an annual award in science given by the European Union, recognizing outstanding scientific and technological achievements resulting from European collaborative research. Today, we are going to hear about his most recent research on coral reef fishing, great models, for Eco de Eco Evo Devo. I take the opportunity to thank uh, Vincent for agreeing to participate in the Assemble Plus conference from far away in Okinawa, taking benefit of the power of the internet. The lecture will be followed by questions and answers. Please keep your microphone switched off. Place first your questions in the chat and we'll ask you to verbalize your question. Please Vincent, thank you and go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Adelino, for these very kind words. So I will share my screen now. Oh, here it is. 
and I will pass like that. So I hope you see it. Yes, it's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, great. So thank you very much for, for this introduction and thank you for the invitation. I. I must say, when I was head of the Banyuls Marine Station, I was uh, I participated to the very first meeting that led to Assemble Plus. So I am very happy to see uh, what it became and uh, and to see the, the very fascinating developments. And it's it's a great success. So I'm very happy to be virtually here, if I may say. And yes, I will uh, I will uh, talk about uh, about coral reef fishes. And present you the models we are we are using, and I I, I would like to add that uh, I have in fact a double position, so I am I am in uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan, but I have also a lab in Academia Sinica in, in Taiwan, where I am up to now uh, I can't go physically for uh, obvious reasons, but uh, but the results I will show you are are, uh, are coming from these two uh, places. So uh, effectively, since now five to six years, we, we develop coral reef fishes as, as model. Oops, why is it not working? Ah, yes, okay. Uh, so basically, I started as a, as a developmental biologist uh, studying nuclear hormone receptors, as uh, Adelino have, have, have said. And, uh, and I was very much interested by, by uh, the, the, the basic developmental mechanism and the, the, the role played by nuclear hormone receptors in these mechanisms. But, but then uh, I, I switched to, to, to a more evolutionary aspect, trying to understand how nuclear hormone receptors play a role in the evolution of developmental mechanisms, and also to study the developmental basis of evolutionary innovations. And I was doing that on zebrafish and on species close to zebrafish, cypriniforms. But rapidly, it became clear to me that if we want to understand evolution and development, we need to better take into account the environment, the ecology of the organisms. And here, cypriniforms are not that great model because their ecology is not that well known. And, and they are living in environments that are very difficult to study on the ecological point of view. So in fact, we switch uh, to what is called now eco evo -devo, and the question we are, of course, uh, tackling are how ecology are, is affecting development, how it's, it's changed the, the, the developmental trajectories, and how also development affect evolution and ecology through uh, niche construction. And uh, you, you will see a bit of that today. And we are, we are now applying this approach of eco evo -devo, uh, to the question of life cycles. Uh, and you should realize that life, complex life cycles are, in fact, the rule in the animal world. They are extremely frequent. Uh, they exist uh, in, in, in insects, they exist in fish, in cnidarians, in arthropods, in many organisms. And in all these cases, uh, there is environmental triggers that are critical in determining when the animal can pass from one stage to another. And in, 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 in these signals are in fact integrated by the, the nervous system, the neuroendocrine system of the animal to regulate hormone levels. So for someone like me interested by hormones and, and ecology, evolution and development, it's of course very good because it allows really to, to connect all these, uh, these, uh, these approach and these dimensions. So we are mostly focusing on metamorphosis and metamorphosis is well known in vertebrates by the uh, transition between a tadpole to a frog. <coughs> Sorry. So it's a spectacular and, and exquisitely coordinated uh, process, post-embryonic, that is known to be controlled by thyroid hormones. And thyroid hormones in, in, in the tadpole uh, uh, trigger and coordinate uh, the transformation of the aquatic tadpole into a small terrestrial frog. And so it's known from a number of, uh, of experiments uh, that tadpoles integrate environmental and physiological cues through the hypothalamo pituitary thyroid axis, regulate thyroid hormone level. And this, uh, there is a peak of thyroid hormones, uh, the precursor T4 and the active hormone T3, that coincide with the climax of metamorphosis, the period during which the change are the most spectacular. And there is also an upregulation of the receptors 
of thyroid hormones. And in, in Xenopus, it is the second receptor, TR beta. So there are two receptors, alpha and beta in vertebrates. So it's TR beta that is regulated by the hormone and that really trigger the whole process. And I, I will not enter into that today, but corticosteroids are also playing an important role in that. So the, the biological question we ask in my lab, in fact, is, is to better understand how hormones control the various manifestation of metamorphosis. But as I told you, we are interested by real life, by the animal in its natural condition uh, to be as close as possible to the, to the will situation. And here, coral reef fish propose many variations in life history strategies. So many change, a subtle or more complex in life cycle. And there is, uh, there is since a long time, a, a large bunch of data on the ecology of these fishes. So there are many labs around the world studying the ecology of coral reef fishes. So these fishes are, are well known in, 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 this, uh, in this context. So we decided to use them as a model. And, <clears throat> and, and, and so I will present you the first uh, species on which we, we worked, which is a certain fish <clears throat> the Acanturus triostegus, uh, the convict surgeon fish, because he had bands uh, like the Dalton brothers, uh, and called also in Tahitian the manini. So it's, <clears throat> it's a classical life cycle of a coral reef fish. Uh, so you have, you have the parents laying eggs, a large number of, of eggs. It's hundreds of, of thousands every uh, two to three weeks. And these eggs, uh, are, are taken by the current and, and go to the open ocean because in fact, the parents are spawning in paths in the reefs. And these eggs in the open ocean give rise to small larvae that are planktonic feeders. And in this species, these larvae will spend 40 to 50 days in the open ocean. And one day they will enter into the reef, transform morphologically very strongly from a small pelagic fish to a small juvenile uh, living in the reef. And this juvenile will, will live in specific nursery habitats in the reefs that are shallow water, calm, protected with not too many predators and a lot of food. And they will grow there during two years and then become adult and reproductively active. And something that is really great with this <coughs> species is that uh, you can uh, capture them very easily by putting a, a, a net at the crest of the reef. And the night without moon, so once per, per, per month during two to three days, you can, the, the larvae will, will, entry, will enter into the reef and they use the, the night without moon to uh, try to reduce as much as they can the, the level of predation. And so you can capture synchronized larvae because the larvae in terms of metamorphosis, they decide to enter into the reef. So they are all at the same stage. And you will see that this is extremely useful for us. I must say that this is a very challenging period of time for them. 90% of the larvae are, 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 um, die during the first day because of predation, 90%. So it's really enormous. And, uh, and they lose 20% of their weight during the three first day of the entry into the reef. And I really would like to, to, to mention here David Lekini from the CRIOB, a lab that is both in Perpignan in France and Moria in French Polynesia, because it is uh, thanks to David that we had an access to, uh, to this uh, fantastic system. So here is what it gives in, in real. This is uh, uh, on, on the top of the slide, you, you, you have a, a, a larvae capture at midnight at the crest of the reef. And as you can see, this is a typical pelagic fish with a shield, uh, a transparent body. And, and this fish uh, is, is in the open ocean. You cannot see it very well because the shield, uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, with the surface of the ocean, uh, hides the fish very well. And the transparency ensures that it is difficult to see for predators. And below, this is a fish at six o'clock in the morning, so the next morning, so six hours after entry to the reef. So the two pictures are separated by only six hours. And as you can see immediately, the, the pigmentation appear very rapidly. And this is a typical pigmentation of the reef fish uh, that is very good for a fish in the reef, but would be dramatic, of course, in the open ocean. 
And after five days, you can see that the pigmentation, of course, uh, just uh, increase a bit in intensity, but all the craniofacial region was transformed because the larvae is a carnivorous plant fish that, that uh, fed on plankton, whereas uh, the, the juvenile is um, <clears throat> an herbivorous fish that graze algal turf uh, that, that grow on, on, on rocks in, in nurseries habitat. So a, a strong transformation. So what we have done was to capture fish on the crest of the reef and then put, to put them in tanks uh, in the lab in Morea for one, two, three, five, up to eight days to follow their thyroid hormone level. And what you can see here for T4, which is uh, monitoring the production of thyroid hormones, uh, from the crest until eight days, you could see uh, a decrease in the T4, uh, in the amount of T4. And we also captured, and it was very difficult, uh, very few larvae from the far and near ocean. And as you can see, you have also very <coughs> a, a decrease. In fact, the peak of thyroid hormone is in, in larvae that are in the near ocean. So you have somehow a peak of thyroid hormones, uh, even if we lack uh, larvae uh, uh, very early one. And you, if you look gene expression, uh, the expression of the receptors for thyroid hormones, and there are three receptors, T alpha A, alpha B, and beta, and the expression of a very uh, classical target genes, uh, KLF9, you could see the same story. You have a peak uh, in the near ocean and then a decrease when the fish enter into the reef. So this is very nice, and this suggests that the entry into the reef coincides with the metamorphosis. In fact, the entry into the reef is the end of the metamorphosis, uh, the lower part of the, of, of the peak. But this is just a correlation. Uh, and we wanted to, to interfere with the system to demonstrate the role of thyroid hormones. And for this, we have two ways of, 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 two, two ways of doing that. The first very simple is to interfere with receptor activity. That is to play uh, with the thyroid hormone receptor. So to treat with T3 thyroid hormones or to block receptor activity with an antagonist that binds to the receptor but impairs its activity. That is, and this antagonist is called NF3. But we can do also something else. We can change the environment. That is, we can capture the larvae at the crest and put it back in the open ocean, in the external slope of the reef, in cage, in the big blue. And it has been shown by McCormick Labs a long time ago that if you do that, the larvae stop their metamorphosis and sometimes even revert to a, a, an oceanic pigmentation. So we use these two systems. And I will show you uh, the result on one head point, which is intestine length. So this is natural classical fish, uh, normal, normal situation, uh, where uh, you see um, the fish at the crest and then one, two, and up to eight days. And the length of the intestine is growing, which is normal because we pass from a carnivorous to an herbivorous fish. And it is known that intestine length is larger in, in herbivores than in carnivores in general. If you treat with steroid hormone here in blue, you could see that uh, at, a, at, a, at the same age, there is intestine length that is a bit bigger. Uh, so suggesting that T3 accelerates the metamorphosis. If you treat with NH3, in, in contrast, you reduce internal intestine lens. In fact, it did not grow. And if you put back thyroid hormones on the NH3 uh, um, treated fish to, to, uh, to check whether this could be a toxic effect, in fact, uh, you resume uh, the normal growth of the intestine. And lastly, in a range, if you put the fish on the external slope, as you can see, it's as if you block NH3 with the NH3, that is you revert the fish uh, to, uh, to a crest style uh, uh, phenotype in terms of intestine. And this is true also later on at five days. So with this, and we use a number of other endpoints, I am just showing th this one, uh, we can show that effectively thyroid hormones is, is acting, uh, regulating this, this transformation of the fish. But as I told you, we, we, we wanted to, to be more close to the ecology. So my, my, my student at that time, uh, Marc Besson, proposed me what he called uh, the Hunger Game experiment. The idea was to make a predation test. 
And I, I must say, I told him it will never work. And as you will see, it works beautifully. So the idea here is we, we, we took a fish at the crest of the reef, and then we treat them either with steroid hormones or NS3, or we put them in the outer slope, so in the, in the big blue, in the sea, uh, for two days or five days. And after that, we, we take back the fish, we put them a small color tag uh, to be able to recognize them, and we put them all together in a cage like that with a predator, which is a snapper. And we, 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 we keep the predator two hours with the fish, and at the end, we count the number of surviving fish. Honestly, I was sure it will never work. And as you can see, it works beautifully well. That is, these are the control fish. The fish treated with steroid hormone survive better. The fish treated with NS3 or relocated to the outer slope survive much less. So our conclusion is that steroid hormone play a role in the quality of the juvenile. When I'm saying quality, I say here the ability to escape predator. And of course, we don't know what it is this ability to escape predator. And we can't say, we can't speak about fitness because fitness means reproduction and they will be uh, sexually mature two years after. So we can't, we can't test that, of course. <clears throat> so we decided to look a bit better in, in what could be the effect of that. So uh, as it is known from the literature that thyroid hormone controls the development of many sensory organs, we decided to look to that. So I will show you that the, here is the story with the nostrils, uh, but you will see that we have uh, we 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 study uh, many different organs, the eyes, the lateral line, and so on. So the nostril in these species are here, and you can see that inside the nostril there is this lamellae, and these lamellae in fact are growing in number during uh, increasing their number during the, the metamorphosis. And so we have done the same experiment that the predation test, take the fish at the crest, um, treat them with either thyroid hormone uh, antagonist or putting them in the external slope. And then after that, monitoring the number of lamellae. And as you can see here, with uh, somehow complex dynamic, uh, what we see very clearly is that thyroid hormone increase the number uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, nostril lamellae, that is, uh, promote the development, uh, the maturation of this, uh, of this sensory organ, whereas NS3 or outer slope decrease it. So this is, okay, uh, an effect on the organ, but does it mean something on the ability of the fish to smell? So with this fish, you can do behavioral tests. So here we have done a test quite simple, we put the small juvenile in an arena in which there are two currents of water parallel arriving and the current do not mix here. And we simply look after a, a, a few minutes where the fish prefer to go. And we compare normal water and water with a predator. So the water here came from a tank in which there is a predator. And so we test the ability of the fish to recognize this other and to uh, understand it and adapt to that. So at D0, so very young fish entering the crest, they are not making very much the difference. But as you can see at day two, uh, the control fish makes very well the difference. And of course, they prefer the odor without the predator, the water without the predator. And now if you treat with steroid hormone, they do that even better. If you treat with the antagonist, they don't do it very well. And if you treat, if you use the fish that went to the outer slope, they in fact prefer slightly the odor of the predator. And then you start to understand the effect of the predation test. Because if they swim to the predator during the predation test ah, here, we can understand the effect. Uh, I, will, I will not go into the details, but we have done very similar experiments on the retina cells and the ability to visually uh, response to the to the to the stimulus of the predator. So we 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 give uh, to the fish the choice of going on one side where there was no predator versus a side where there was a predator. And as you can see, we find the same results. So the conclusion of this part is that metamorphosis, the, the entry into the reef is uh, the, the colonization into the reef is. Uh, 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 thyroid hormone dependent metamorphosis. And in fact, the peak of thyroid hormone started very early on in the open ocean 
Uh, and so the entry into the reef coincide, with, in fact, with the end of this process. And this is where uh, this model, which is, as you have seen, a very nice ecological model because you can capture them easily, you can manipulate them, uh, in a, and you can do a behavioral test with them. Uh, it's not a very nice model because it's very difficult to have an access to oceanic larvae. In fact, we, we succeed in capturing nine oceanic larvae by renting a tuna boat during five days. So it was really a pity. Uh, so uh, so we will, you will see that we will switch to, a, to another model in a minute. But I, I want to, to, to continue on this model for a few seconds. Because uh, you know, of course, coral reefs are very nice place, but they are threatened very much. And among the many stress acting on 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 uh, coral reef fish, on coral reefs in general, there is pollution, of course. And one of the of the compound we decided to look was uh, chlorpyrifos, because chlorpyrifos is a pesticide uh, used heavily in agriculture and also in tropical agriculture. And in fact, it is used in French Polynesia, and it is it has been found in micromolar doses in one. Uh, Aconturus, not the same species than the one we are using, but uh, clearly say, suggesting that there is effectively uh, uh, this compound uh, at relevant dose in the in the uh, in the environment. And and chlorpyrifos is interesting because it is known in a number of systems to decrease steroid hormone level. And in fact, this is what we see here. If you measure uh, T four at day two, or T uh, three uh, or T four, you can see a decrease. Dose dependent, 1, 5, 30 microgram per liter of chlorpyrifos in the water um, in the in the acanthurus uh, captured at the reef at the crest of the reef. And uh, so we, of course, decided to look the same endpoints that we have we have I, I have shown you, and I will not show you uh, everything. But we test uh, intestine lens, we test grazing activity. And we test uh, the uh, sensory organ development and uh, the nostril lamellae. And you can see here a decrease dose dependent after five days. We can see also a decrease in the maturation of the lateral line canals. Uh, again, dose dependent, very, very clear effect. And so we decided to do the predation test. And, and, uh, and as you can see, the result is very clear. If we compare the control and the stressed fish in the predation test, the stressed fish uh, uh, survive much less than the control ones. And this is a predator and this is the, the, the poor fish. Uh, now, we, we thought, okay, but we can go a bit further. That is, we know, uh, we, our hypothesis is that this effect of chlorpyrifos is due to a decrease of thyroid hormones. So if we are correct, it means that if in this fish, we injected back thyroid hormones, we should be able to go back to a normal uh, predation level. So this is a rescue experiment and we have done this experiment. And as you can see, we rescue partially, not totally of course, but partially, if we inject thyroid hormones in the CPF treated fish, we have a predation level that is much better than the CPF treated fish. Suggesting, and uh, to my knowledge, it's the first time that it is very clearly shown in the case of chlorpyrifos in such experimental setting, that, that uh, chlorpyrifos effectively impair the maturation of the fish in a TH dependent manner. Okay, so now from this, we are, we are going uh, uh, to, to a step further. That is, we, we, our conclusion here is that thyroid hormones is controlling the quality of the juvenile emanating from the metamorphosis. So we thought maybe uh, the next step would be to test if thyroid hormone could be a proxy uh, able to measure the quality of an habitat. So currently, my PhD student, Mathieu Reno, is in French Polynesia, and he is uh, he's, um, taking fish at the crest of the reef, you can see here with my arrow, and he's putting the fish in various habitat, good habitat or very bad habitat, dead zone, or middle class habitat, let's say. And he will be able to compare uh, after that in these various fishes, uh, their quality in terms of predation test, their level of hormones, uh, the progression of their metamorphosis, their behavior, uh, and so on. So this would be able to test if we could use thyroid hormone as an endpoint to assess the quality of an environment for a fish. 
And we are preparing an expedition in for next December uh, in this atoll, uh, Tairao in the French Tuamotu, which is a closed atoll with a lagoon that is totally isolated with more salty and more hot water. But there are Acanturus inside the lagoon. So they are living in an environment that is different from the natural environment. And again, we will try to see if there is uh, a connection with the thyroid hormone in terms of local adaptation of these populations. Okay, so as I told you, uh, all this is very nice. This model is superb, but we can't have uh, very easily access to the early larvae. And this is why uh, we decided to switch uh, to develop a second model. So we are still working as a, you have seen on the, on the, on the surgeon fish, but we develop uh, another model. And this other model is the clownfish, Amphiprion cellaris, which we think will, will become an experimental model uh, of interest. So the main reason why using this, this model is that it is possible to have the uh, wall cycle inside the lab. So you can see here the parents, the parents are laying eggs and here the eggs are stick on a rock close to the sea anemone on which they are living. And, uh, and there is an embryonic development that is very long, seven days when compared to uh, let's say two days in most, in many fishes, not all of course, but many fishes like the zebrafish. And then you have a larval stage that is relatively short, seven days. At seven days, you have what we call a young recruit and a young recruit will enter into the reef, find a sea anemone and be accepted by the fish being present already and find its place in the colony. So all these post embryonic development period here is in the open ocean. And then the fish will have to enter into the reef and, and find a sea anemone. And you can reproduce all that in the lab quite easily. It's not zebrafish, but, uh, but uh, still it's, it's possible to, to do it. Oops, sorry. Ah, yes. And so what you can see during, uh, during embryonic, post-embryonic development, so this is uh, on top here, this is a larvae of clownfish at hatching. And, uh, and we define seven developmental stages from uh, uh, hatching to, uh, to the recruitment into the sea anemone. And as you can see, we have uh, a, a strong morphological transformation. And here we have a very strong pigmentation phenotype. So the pigmentation appears during uh, this, uh, this uh, metamorphosis. And Natasha Roux, uh, who was a PhD student in my lab uh, at that time, who is now a postdoc, uh, in, in the lab in, in Banyuls. Uh, Natasha uh, have done a transcriptomic analysis of these post-embryonic stages. That is, she selects three larvae per stage. Uh, so seven stages, three larvae, 21 fishes. And we have done a complete transcriptomic analysis of the complete larvae, no dissection because they are much too small uh, at the beginning. And here is what we, what we got. So very clearly what we can see is that we have we have two big periods. We have a first period that is here highlighted in blue that coincide with the three first stages and that corresponds to larval growth. And then we have another period here in orange that coincide to the late stages that is five, six, seven, which is clearly the metamorphosis and during which we see the, the juvenile pigmentation appearing. And we have a transitional stage, which is stage four, that is between the two, and that is really the pivotal stage between the larval growth and the metamorphosis. And if you can, if, if you take the, the uh, hundred top genes in terms of difference of expression between between uh, larvae and juvenile, you can see the same story here: uh, uh, the larval growth genes, the metamorphosis genes, and the pivotal gene at stage four. And we measure thyroid hormone during this various stage. And as you can see, we have a peak of T4 at stage four, very clear. This uh, high level of thyroid hormones in stage one and stage two, and in fact, the remnant of the embryonic thyroid hormones that are in the egg. And so we have, we interpret that as a peak of thyroid hormone that is uh, uh, at the stage that coincide to the onset of metamorphosis. So we decided to look a bit in more detail into that. And as you can see, uh, this stage four 
mark a shift in, in many biological pathways. So tyrol hormone synthesis and the signaling pathway, ossification, pigmentation, digestion. I am not showing you metabolism, but we have a lot of data showing that metabolism is completely transformed during this, uh, this uh, uh, metamorphosis and visual perception. And we thought, okay, let's go into more detail uh, and into functional analysis of this, of this uh, visual perception phenotype. So we, we, for doing that, uh, we study the, the expression of the opsin gene. So the opsins are genes in the retina that are controlling the color vision. And as you can see, we have short wavelengths opsins expressed very highly in the, in the pelagic larvae and decreasing after. And these opsin are mostly detecting blue colors, which fit very well with the pelagic larvae, which is in the big blue and has to recognize variations in the blue color. Whereas the young juveniles are, are mostly expressing a long wavelength uh, obscene that is allowing to see in the yellow, orange, red. Uh, so uh, a totally different range of color. And again, this is consistent with, with the ecology we know of these uh, small fishes that are uh, in the very difficult position to enter into the reef and, uh, and they have to find very rapidly a sea anemone. <coughs> So we, we, we decided to look if these opsin genes were uh, regulated by thyroid hormones. And for this, we took uh, young larvae, uh, stage three larvae, and we treat them with thyroid hormones. And as expected, the short wavelength opsin, the blue one is, could, you could see that the activity, the expression, sorry, is repressed by thyroid hormones. Whereas the uh, long wavelength opsin that allow to see in the orange, is activated by thyroid hormones. But does this uh, coincide with the visual preference of the larvae? So we compare the visual preference of stage two, so uh, pelagic larvae, or stage six uh, reef associated larvae, if I can say. And uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a room where there is on one side blue color and the other side orange color. And this is a classical behavioral test to see to test the preference of the larvae. Uh, the larvae have the choice of remaining in the center, going to the blue, going to the orange. And as you can see, the stage two larvae, they prefer very much the blue than the orange, whereas the stage six larvae, they prefer the orange than, than the blue, which is fitting perfectly well with their expression level of the opsin genes. So we thought, okay, but is thyroid hormone playing a role into this hysteroid hormone able to change this visual preference. So we took pelagic larvae and we treat them with steroid hormones. And as you can see in the, in the control fish, we found again the fact that the fish prefer the blue. Whereas when we treat them with steroid hormones, honestly, they don't go strongly to the orange, but they remain in the center and they don't go at all to the blue. So we interpret that as they are changing their visual preference because they could remain in the blue, but they don't go it, to it at all. So again, what, what, does this, what is the take home message of all this? The take home message is that thyroid hormones are doing three things. They are of course controlling the onset of metamorphosis and we have not sufficiently studied that. And we are currently, uh, my, my, Laurence Besson, who, who is an assistant professor in Banyuls and who took over my team in, in Banyuls, uh, is really focusing on that. It coordinates the metamorphosis at the organism level. And you have seen that both uh, in, in, in the surgeon fish and in the clownfish very clearly, but also it controls the quality of the juvenile emanating from the metamorphosis. And this is quite a new idea because it has never been tested as such in, in other models such, such as uh, Xenopus, uh, for example. <coughs> So now uh, in, in, in Japan, we are mostly focusing on the pigmentation of clown fishes. And we are doing that for, for four main reasons. First, this pigmentation is really conspicuous. It's beautiful and it's extremely visible. And now I have the opportunity to dive almost every weekend here. And I can tell you that, yes, you can recognize very easily from far the clown fishes because you can see them very well. This pigmentation pattern is very diverse. So these, there are 30 species of anemone fishes. And as you can see, they have always a pigmentation with uh, white bars, uh, except few species uh, that are quite conspicuous. 
<clears throat> but this is very variable with the number of bars changing from one species to another. <clears throat> and as you have seen, this pigmentation occurs during metamorphosis. And you will see, and I will go, <clears throat> sorry, in more detail in a minute, it is polymorphic. <clears throat> it can change from one, uh, one environment to the other. So we decided to look <clears throat> if the pigmentation was regulated by thyroid hormones, of course. And the answer is yes. So Pauline and Salis have done this experiment in, in my lab. So if you take a, a five-day larvae, <clears throat> you, you, you uh, treat it with steroid hormone. As you can see, the white bars are appearing more rapidly than in the control. And if you do the reverse experiment, you take a nine-day larvae, <clears throat> uh, you treat it uh, with MPI, which is a, 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 a mix of drug that block steroid hormone secretion, you could see that in nine days, uh, at night, at day nine, you don't see uh, white bars in in the MPI treated fish, uh, whereas you see them in the in the control fish. And we 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 did not use NS3 because NS3, the antagonist that we are using in in a, in a surgeon fish, for obscure reason, is still not working very well in clone fishes, and we are actively working on that. Okay, but the 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 story here is very clear. Thyroid hormone uh, uh, accelerates uh, white bar formation in clone fishes. And uh, as we have studied in more detail, the, the cells uh, underlying the white pigmentation uh, of the clone fishes, these cells are iridophores. And we have detected specific genes uh, expressed in iridophore by a transcriptomic experiment. And as you can see, many of these genes, I'm showing here two of them, but we have tested 10 of them, are uh, activated by thyroid hormones uh, uh, and activated during the metamorphosis. OK, so it, it, these genes are RTH responsive. Now, what is interesting in the clown fishes uh, is that their pigmentation, as I told you, is polymorphic. And there is one very clear case where it is linked to the, to the sea anemone. So Amphiprion percula, which is a sister species of uh, Amphiprion ocellaris that we are using in the lab, very similar species. These species can live into two sea anemone, Eteractis magnifica with long tentacles, or Stichodactyla gigantea, the carpet sea anemone with very short tentacles, which is a very harmful sea anemone, very stinging. And as you can see, those living in Stichodactyla are melanized, are more, much more black when compared to those living in Eteractis. And by the way, this has been observed by other authors uh, in two other species of, of uh, anemone fishes. So it's apparently something quite uh, common in, the, in those fish. And we collaborated with a search plan lab uh, in Perpignan, in, in the CRIOB, uh, who with uh, Jeff Jones, uh, uh, Jeff Jones in, is studying Amphiprion percula population in Papua New Guinea, in the Bismarck Sea, at Kimbe Island. And in Kimbe Island, we see exactly that. Those, the, the fish present in Eteractis uh, are, are normal, whereas those living in Stichodactyla are much more black. But Pauline Salis, my, my, who, who is a postdoc in the lab, have observed another phenotype in this fish. In fact, she checked uh, the rate of appearance of white bars in, in young recruits of Amphiprion percula living in Eteractis or living in Stichodactyla. And as you can see very clearly, those living in Stichodactyla get their three stripes much more rapidly than those living in Eteractis. In those old fish here, you have only 10% of the fish having uh, the, the three bars uh, when they are in Eteractis, whereas you have uh, already 25% of them having the three bars <coughs> when they are in Stichodactyla. And this is, uh, we have done with Benoit Pujol a lot of uh, uh, statistical uh, experiments to check that this is linked to the sea anemone species and not to other factors. And of course, <clears throat> we were very much interested by this observation because uh, we just showed that thyroid hormone is controlling uh, 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 the appearance of white bars in, in the sister species uh, Amphiprion ocellaris. So, I asked to, uh, to search, to, uh, to search plan to capture for us very young recruits 
uh, taken from Eteractis or from Stichodactyla, and we bring them back to the lab in France, and we measure thyroid hormone levels. And to our surprise and delight, thyroid hormone level is much higher in the new recruits living in Stichodactyla rather than those uh, living in Eteractis. So since uh, we got sufficient amount of uh, young recruits, we decided to do a transcriptomic experiment. So we, we have done, uh, we have taken uh, five larvae in the uh, Eteractis and, 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 and five in Stichodactyla. And we, we, we extract RNA from the complete entire larvae, again, not too complicated to dissect. And we compare the gene expression. And I was thinking, okay, we will have thousands of genes, but it will be a nightmare. We had very few genes that were differentially regulated between the two uh, environments. Uh, only 25 passed the threshold. And among those genes, one was electrifying me. And this gene is called DRUX. And DRUX means dual oxidase and is a gene very important for thyroid hormone synthesis in human, but also in zebrafish. And, and, and it has been shown that the morpholino injection, uh, the morpholino inhibition of drugs in zebrafish was causing uh, hypothyroidy. So decreased level of thyroid hormone. And here drugs is overexpressed in the uh, fish living in Stichodactyla. So in collaboration with David Parici, we, sorry, it's David Parici has, has done the knockout by CRISPR-Cas9 of drugs in zebrafish. And what he has shown, and to make a long story short, I can show you that here, uh, is that iridophores appear much slower, slower in the drox mutant than in the wild type mutant. So they appear, and in fact, at the end, there are even more iridophores in the drox knockout animals than in the control. But their rate of appearance is much decreased in the drox mutant when compared to the wild type. Exactly the same phenotype in reverse that we have in the clownfish living in Stichodactyla, where the white bars are appearing more rapidly. So we, we think that here we have a very nice case of phenotypic plasticity that is controlled by a change in hormone level. And now, of course, the question is why thyroid hormone level is higher in the clownfish living in Stichodactyla than those living in Eteractis. And this is something we will experimentally address here in Okinawa by, by manipulating uh, the sea anemone and the clownfish in experimental conditions. In fact, in Okinawa uh, and in the water uh, very close to the lab, we have six species of, uh, of uh, clownfishes, Ophiprion ocellaris here, Ophiprion clarki here, and, and other species. And as you can see, uh, six different uh, pigmentation patterns. And so we will focus on these species to really uh, understand the basis of their uh, pigmentation pattern and the, the, the plasticity of these patterns, because I will not go into the details, but they are changing according to the environment in a very interesting way. And so to finish, uh, I would like to, to, to go uh, briefly uh, on, over a few slides to try to convince you that uh, the, the clown fishes are, are nice model of marine fishes that could become uh, really uh, great in the future. So, uh, oops, sorry. Yes. Uh, so today, I, uh, I have I have presented you. I have worked two models: the, the Manini, the the, the Aconturus, the surgeon fish, which is a great ecological model, but without access to development. And honestly, uh, it will take a lot of time uh, before we can have an access to development. And the clown fishes. So now we are really focusing for for experimental model uh, to the on the clown fish. So these fish are relatively easy to breed in, 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 uh, in a husbandry. So they are living as uh, isolated couples in 60 liter tanks and uh, without sea anemone, uh, we just put a terracotta pot. And uh, if the fish are nice, they lay their eggs on the pot. If they are not nice, they lay their eggs on the glass, but normally they lay the eggs on, on the pot. And the, the female is defending the colony, the male is taking care of the eggs. And you can see here the fry developing in, in, in small tanks. And we have, uh, uh, so the, the raising the, the larvae uh, is really delicate, so much more difficult than, than zebrafish or medaka, but you can do it with rotifers and artemia. 
And, uh, and we have set up a system that allows to make a pharmacological treatment in small beaker, in small groups of five fishes. So we can uh, now do, uh, do a lot of pharmac pharmacological treatments quite easily with this system. So we have really pushed the model. So we have uh, 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 published uh, two years ago now, uh, complete post-embryonic developmental staging uh, in developmental dynamics. And today, in fact, we have submitted to developmental dynamics a second paper describing in detail the embryonic developmental stages. We just have in press in JSB uh, a description of all our husbandry methods. And we uh, are collaborating with uh, Nicolas Salama Lab in Lausanne, who has done genome studies, and they have now a complete genome sequence of each of the 30 species of clown fishes. And the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, is coming. Fabio Cortesi in Australia have, have shown a very promising result, and Masato Kinoshita in Kyoto, with who we are collaborating, have also generated uh, a, a pigmentation, uh, a tyrosine as a, a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, mutant in clan fishes. So I think it will come very rapidly now in, in routine. Uh, something really great for pigmentation is that there are many pet shop pigmentation mutants that, that were developed by, by companies because they are nice and uh, people like to, to buy them. But of course, these mutants are extremely interesting for people that want to understand the, the, the basis of pigmentation. And we are currently uh, finishing a paper describing all the pet shop mutants and natural variants present uh, to show what can we say on the pigmentation patterning system that is, that is laying behind that? And something that is really great with clown fishes is that their social system makes them great ecological and functional model in the lab. So the social system is quite simple. You have a dominant female that is defending actively the colony. You have a smaller male uh, so you have a strong size hierarchy, and the smaller male is taking care of the eggs. And then you have non-breeders, juveniles, ranked by order, minus one, minus two, up to minus six, uh, depending on the size of the sea anemone. And these uh, juveniles are on a queue for reproduction. If the, the, the male die, uh, the first juvenile will become a male and will reproduce on the female. So if you consider the Pixar movie, in the Pixar movie, uh, Nemo, uh, the, the mother on, of Nemo die. And in real life, it means that the father of Nemo will transform into a female, and Nemo, who is the biggest juvenile, will transform into a male and make babies with his former father who became his wife. And now you understand why Pixar have changed a bit the movie. By the way, uh, this uh, is a very nice system because, of course, you can study sex change and you can control it because if you leave out the male, uh, this one will, the first juvenile will transform into a male. If you leave out the female, the male will transform into a female. You can also uh, study the inter-individual competition. And there is a lot of aggression. There is a lot of communication, visual, by sound, because they are producing noise. You have a social control of growth. You have competitive growth between juveniles when they are of the same size. So you have a number of questions that you can handle with, with such a, a social system. And now the good thing is that, in fact, in the, in the, in the wild, clownfish never leave their sea anemone. And so you can make individual long-term monitoring. That is, if you are seeing a fish in a given sea anemone, you come back two weeks after, it is the same fish. You are sure of it. And you can, by the way, test it by doing fin clips. So you can do long-term functional experiments in the sea, like exchange of sea anemone, change of colony structure, behavioral test, fin clip, mucus uh, extraction, access to the egg, movie, long-term monitoring, and so on. And, and of course, combined with the possibility to, to manipulate the fish in the, in the lab, this gives a bunch of tools that are very promising. So I just would like to mention one case that is really spectacular that is done by a series of Australian, American, and French lab, which is a quite unique long-term 
field experiment at Kimbe in Papua New Guinea. So Kimbe is here in Papua New Guinea in this big bay. And in this big bay here, you have a small island here, very isolated. There is uh, more than 10 kilometers between, oops, between the island and, uh, and uh, its neighbor island. And in Kimbe Island, they have done a map uh, mapping every sea anemone present and, and capturing every uh, parents present, taking fin clips, putting them back in the sea anemone. So they are, they are okay. Huh? You have no, no effect on, on the fish. So they take small fin clips and they make fingerprints. So now they have fingerprints of each reproductive couple of uh, the fish in this island. And then they come every, oh, I have to, sorry. The, the, the light is automatically turned off in, in Japan at that time. So <laughs> I, I was at a risk of losing my power, uh, but I have finished. So they, they, you, you can, you can um, uh, you, then now when the, the, they have each uh, parent's fingerprinted, and so now they go every two years, and every two years they take young recruits, they fingerprint them, and so they can know who are the parents. And as you can see with these uh, with these uh, maps, they can know what are the sea anemone produce, what are the couples in sea anemone producing a lot of of young recruits. Where are going these recruits? Where are what is the dispersal pattern? What, what are the genealogical relationship between the fishes? And so it's a long-term genetic experiment in real life. They are doing that since more than 10 years. So they have a fantastic amount of data that will be, of course, very interesting to address a number of questions at the genetic level, but in natural populations. Okay, if you want to know more, we uh, published uh, recently two reviews, one recently in EvoDevo specifically on animal fishes and one in Trends in Genetics in, in, in 2019 about the pigmentation of, color, of uh, coral reef fish and what they can bring to understanding color pattern evolution. Uh, and I think it's a very promising uh, field also. And I would like to thank uh, all the people in my lab. So people in my former lab in Banyuls, who are still very active. Huh? Laurence Besso is still uh, uh, using clan fishes. And so the clan fish model is available to assemble plus people if they want uh, in Banyuls. And people in my lab in Oist and in Academia Sinica in Taiwan, uh, the team of uh, Tim Ravazi, who is also using clan fishes in Oist. So we have very good relationship and we share a lot of uh, resources. I really would like to thank the people of the CRIOB, uh, David Lekini, Benoit Pujol, and Serge Plan, because without them, we would have never uh, uh, be able to start uh, on, on coral reef fish. They have been really instrumental in our, in our success. And David Parici uh, in, in, in the US for, for the CRISPR-Cas9 in, in, uh, in zebrafish. And uh, I thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. That was uh, very interesting. Is uh, there any questions? Well, I have, I have a, a few questions. One is on the surgeon fish, and I guess this mm -hmm. also applies to the, to the clown fish. So you, you showed some of the effects of the thyroid on you know, internal morphology, but did you see also, uh, particularly in the, in the surgeon fish, because there's big change in, in, the, in the larvae uh, to juvenile, uh, you know, like in, in, the, in the head and, you know, shape and, and things like that in external morphology. Yes. So there was before, uh, even before us, uh, Bruno Frédéric uh, in uh, Liège in Belgium, have done a morphometrics analysis of, of uh, the various stage of uh, post-embryonic development in the surgeon fish, showing uh, very precisely by morphometry the, the change of shape of the of the of the head, and in the in the first e life paper we have done, we we added a, a more precise analysis of the teeth, uh, and the teeth are, are changing very heavily from a carnivorous type teeth to herbivorous type teeth. Mm -hmm. So the transformation is really at every level. It's it's really huge. Good. Uh, the the other one is uh, the other question. Uh, it's more a curiosity. I don't know if, you know, are, are there individual patterns of, of, of uh, coloring in the, in the clownfish? I mean, mm. you mentioned environment effects, but 
How about individual patterns? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. And in fact, uh, this is something we are starting to look uh, in great details. It seems to depend from one species to another. But in Ocellaris and Percula, the two species we, we used uh, the most, it's very clear that there is individual patterns. And we believe, but we have not yet proved, but we are starting to discuss that with Peter Boston uh, lab in, in Boston, uh, that uh, individual recognition is very important. And I think it's very important, especially in Ophiprion percula who live in, in big sea anemone with huge colonies. Very often there is six to eight fish inside a colony. So their relationship are, could be extremely complex. Mm -hmm. And we believe they are able to recognize individually uh, their, their, uh, their mates, if I may say. But we have to prove it, yeah, which so will is, not be easy. Yeah, it will be interesting to see if there is any connection to the MHC system as well. Yeah. This is the case. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that, just the last one. Uh, is do you, do you think that this difference in thyroid uh, between the different anemone mm -hmm. is it any signals coming from the anemone that maybe that maybe somehow controlling you know the axis? Yeah, we that, that's obviously something we would like to do. Uh, it's up to now very difficult to do uh, in the system we are using that is in Kimbe because they are going only twice. Uh, one, once every two years in Kimbe with a boat with very few possibilities in, in terms of experiments. So we have to reproduce the system here to be able to work on that. But, uh, but yes, I think the fish is sensing that is, my interpretation is that the fish is sensing that he is living in a different environment. Mm -hmm. It could be food. We don't know very well uh, what they are actually eating in the wild and maybe they have not access to the same food, uh, depending on the sea anemones they are living in. Uh, it may be a reaction to the stinging uh, system of the sea anemone. Uh, that's the, it could be also uh, stress due to the fact that in the Teractis, they can hide very easily. When there is a predator, they can hide very easily inside the tentacles. They are no longer visible. Uh -huh. In Stichodactylas that have very short tentacles, they can't play that. Okay. They are always visible. So maybe this is an effect. Mm -hmm. So there are many possibilities. But yes, of course, we would like to, do, uh, to, to look to that. In the transcriptomic data, we did not see very clearly, uh, apart from Duox, that is the other genes, uh, were not neuroendocrine factor. They mm -hmm. were mostly genes uh, related to vision. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, seems as there are no, no other questions. Thank you very much, Vincent. Thank very you very much. Talk and uh, good luck with these new uh, models and, and so on. And uh, well, you know, I think there's lot, a lot of uh, interesting things to do there, as you, as you pointed out. And, thank uh, you very thank much. You. Thank you everyone Thank you. For, for listening and for, for seeing uh, this presentation. And we'll be back at 11.30 uh, with, uh, with, with uh, another event, which will be the Cryo Preservation Brokerage event. Uh, so 11.30 uh, Central European time. Thank you very okay. much. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah, and see bye bye. You. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. At NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project.
We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more.